So on this clip we're going to talk about properties of moving average processes short MA. In particular we're going to look at MA1, MAQ and MA infinity processes and we're going to look at their mean variance and autocovariance. The autocovariance that's important because that will lead to the autocorrelation and we know we use these to describe univariate processes. So we're going to start with an MA1 process. Here it is and we assume that the error terms epsilon t are iid distributed with zero mean and variance sigma squared. So the parameters are the mu, the theta1 and the sigma squared and these parameters will together with the fact that it's an MA1 will determine all these properties of the MA process, the mean variance and auto covariances. So let's start with the mean or the expected value of yt. So expected value of yt is equal to the expected value and we have just substituted in our process equation. And this is an expected value of a sum that's the same as the sum of the expected values and the expected values of the epsilons are zero. So altogether we get mu. The variance of yt it's a bit more complicated, so the variance, that's the same as the variance of yt minus mu, as mu is a constant. So subtracting the constant doesn't change the variance. And now this yt minus mu, we will substitute this for this from the DGP. That's our equation up here, which we've written down the MA1 process. So let's do that substitute for yt minus mu, so we have the variance of epsilon t plus theta 1 times epsilon t minus 1. And as epsilon t and epsilon t minus 1 are independent, we can decompose the variance of the sum into the sum of the variances. And finally, we can bring that theta 1 outside the variance operator, that turns into theta 1 squared, due to normal variance operations. Next thing we ought to recognize is that the variance of these two terms, variance of the epsilons, are of course just sigma squared. And that allows us to simplify this or to restate the result for the variance of yt to be equal to sigma squared times 1 plus theta 1 squared. Okay, so all the parameters, it's only parameters that describe this variance, in this case sigma squared and theta 1. Next, we're going to look at the autocovariances. Let's move that up. So, the first one we're going to look at is the covariance between yt and yt minus 1. Now, the definition of a covariance is that it's the expected value of the first term minus its expected value times the second term minus its expected value. We now should recognize from what we did before that of course these terms, the expected values, are just equal to mu. So let's substitute that in. That makes the whole thing look just that little bit nicer. And what we do next is exactly what we did before. We recognize that these terms We'll just, we will just substitute for these from our data generating process. That was the asterisk equation we had labeled out before. We then end up with the following, and I will write this on two lines on purpose, and we will use that technique later. Yt minus mu is the same, and that is just substituted from the DGP. That's the same as epsilon t plus theta 1 times epsilon t minus 1. Now yt minus 1 minus mu, we'll write that on the second line, is just the same as epsilon t minus 1 plus theta 1 times t minus 2. And you can see I write terms with the same timing on top of each other. So what we now need to recognize is that here we can really factor out all these terms. So we get four terms, but as epsilon t and epsilon t minus j, if j is larger than zero, are independent, any expectation 
that involves a cross product of epsilon t and epsilon t minus j is just going to be equal to zero. And therefore, the only terms that survive are those where epsilon t minus 1 here, epsilon t minus 1 and epsilon t minus 1 are multiplied with each other. All other terms will involve epsilon t's of different timings and the expectation of these terms will be zero. So all we are concerned about is this term. That's going to be theta 1 times epsilon t minus 1 squared. So that looks much simpler. We can uh, get the theta 1 outside the expectations operator. So we get theta 1 times the expectation of epsilon t minus 1 squared. And now we need to recognize that the expectation of the squared epsilons is just going to be the same as the variance of the epsilons. And that is because the expected value of the epsilons is zero. So the result here is going to be sigma squared times theta 1. So we have the covariance of yt, yt minus 1, sigma squared times theta 1. Now from this little thing here, what we can recognize is that we only have terms surviving, i.e. non-zero terms, if there's an overlap between these two lines. Right? Only then we have surviving terms. And that implies that, for instance, for an MA1, which is the process we are looking at right, right now, that the covariance between yt and, say, yt minus 2 would indeed be equal to zero. And the reason is that the second line would be moved one step further on. And more generally, the covariance between yt and yt minus j, for any j larger than 1, is going to be zero. Where that j larger than 1, that 1 here, corresponds to the order of the MA process. Let's go to the MAQ. So let's state the Q order MA process. So we have ET epsilon t minus 1, epsilon t minus 2, and up to epsilon t minus q terms, our error term epsilon t is defined as before as iid with variance sigma squared. So we're now going to use very, very similar arguments as we did for the MA1 process. And very straightforward, that will lead to the expected value of that MAQ process being equal to mu, and the variance of that MAQ process being equal to sigma squared times 1 plus theta 1 squared plus theta 2 squared plus all the way to theta Q squared. You should be able to, to do that yourself. A little bit more complicated are the autocovariances. Let's recall from the MA1 this equation here. The, the autocovariance is really just defined as this expected value. So let's replicate that here. For the MA1, we started out with just the covariance between yt and yt minus 1. Now we'll state it generally between t and t minus j. Covariance between yt and yt minus j. So again, these terms we will just substitute from our DGP equation here. That's We label that equation with hash. That is our DGP up here. Let's label that here as the hash equation. So if we do that, we can substitute yt minus mu as follows. Oh, again, I, sh I should say I'll do that with a two-line approach. That is to see where the overlap is. So first, yt minus mu can be replaced with epsilon t, basically just the process replicated all the way to mu q epsilon t minus q. Now we want to write the second term y t minus j minus mu on the second line. In order to know where exactly we should write that, we really need to know what the lag is. So therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to do this again for the example of a first order covariance. So for covariance y t and y t minus 1, that means we have a one period offset and y t minus 1 minus mu can be substituted with epsilon t minus 1 plus theta 1 times epsilon t minus 2 
and the last term is going to be, that's supposed to be easiest to start with, theta q times epsilon t minus 1 minus q. So epsilon t minus 1 minus q. So that's the last term. And that's clearly one term behind the last for the first line. And now this last but one term is going to be theta q minus 1 times epsilon t minus q. So that matches up with the last term of the first line. So, writing it like this now helps us to identify where we have overlaps again in terms of timing, and they occur here. So that means we will get non-zero terms. Always the expectations of the squared error terms will be non-zero. We will have surviving terms, and we will write them down soon. But we should also note that there will be terms which involve cross products of epsilons which are not at the same time. So epsilon t minus j times epsilon t minus i, if i and j are different, the expectations of these terms will disappear. So if we recognize that, it's pretty straightforward to see that we are left with the following terms theta 1 times epsilon t minus 1 times epsilon t minus 1, so that's epsilon t minus 1 squared, plus, and now the cross product involving the two epsilon t minus 2's, that's theta 1 times theta 2 times epsilon t minus 2 squared. And then all sorts of terms, and we'll jump to the last term uh, involving epsilon t minus q, and that's going to be theta q minus 1 times theta q times epsilon t minus q squared. So that's all that we are left with and what we can now do is we can decompose that expectation of a sum into a sum of expectations and take out constant parameters and what we are left with is this. So let's just complete that. Let's just fairly straightforward. Now again we should recognize that all these terms, expectation of squared error terms, all of these are of course nothing else but the variance of the error term which is sigma squared. And that allows us to simplify this result to sigma squared times theta 1 plus theta 1 times theta 2 plus all the way to theta q minus 1 to theta q. Now let's label that as the triangle equation, because we will get back to this. And label this equation up here, the square equation. Okay, so now we're going to do a little bit of simplification. Well, first, actually, before we do simplification, let's return to the square equation first. So we saw that if we have an overlap between the first and the second line, then we have surviving terms. If, however, j is larger than q, then there will be no overlap because that second line will be moved so far to the right that we don't have an overlap. And therefore the covariance of yt in yt minus j is going to be zero if j is larger than q. And that is for that particular maq process which we have written out so that q, j larger than that q, that q comes from that maq process. Now let's go to the triangle equation and let's simplify that uh, because we want to make the generalization a little bit easier. So it turns out Let's re remind us what that last line was. That was the covariance between yt and yt minus 1. So now um, si I'll simplify and generalize in one step. And I'm going to write down the result. And it's not going to be immediately obvious where that comes from. But you can check that it's true. I'll tell you how you can do that in the end. So the covariance... Oh, before I do that, let's define theta naught to be equal to 1. That will make life easier, then in an MAQ process, 
it turns out that the covariance between yt and yt minus j, so it's not t minus 1, but in general t minus j, is equal to the following. It turns out to be equal to sigma squared times the sum from now, an index s, which starts with j and goes all the way to q, and we sum the following product of parameters theta s minus j times theta s. Okay, now this looks a little bit complicated perhaps, and what you should do is you should check that this is true by substituting for j the value 1, and then you should be able to recover the result in the triangle equation. Now that's not to prove that this is always true, but with a bit of algebra you can show it that it is always true. Now that index, that sum starts from s equals to j, sometimes we like to start these sums from rather from s equals to zero, so this result can be rewritten, there's no change, can be rewritten by just rearranging that index, and then we sum from s equals to zero to q minus j, and the coefficient the what we sum is theta s times theta s plus j. Now, again, to make sense of this, it's possibly best to just set j equal to 1 and establish for yourself that what you get then is the result in the triangle equation. So these two formulations are really alternatives. Turns out that the latter one is sort of the nicer to work with because it starts with 0. Let's move on to the MA infinity process. Now you, you may wonder why. Well, it turns out it's quite useful. Uh, you may learn about what's called the Volt representation or the Volt theorem, but I'm not going to discuss this here, but it, it has its theoretical use. Now, in a way, the MA infinity is, is a sort of special case from, of the MAQ process, in particular for Q, you know, going to infinity, if Q turns out to be very, very large. We're going to draw a table. In this table we're going to write down the expected value variances and the auto covariances and we're going to write them down for the MA1, Q and MA infinity process. Now the first two columns we have established the results already so let's just put them down here. That's uh, for the MA1 and for the MAQ we also established all of this. Okay, just repetition of our previous results. Now the MA infinity process turns out the expected value is again mu for exactly the same reason. The variance is really the same as the variance for the MAQ, just that we don't stop summing up terms. Okay, we we'll just keep on going after theta two squared and so forth. And for the autocovariance, we really replicate the result for the MAQ process, just that we set Q to infinity, so we sum to Q minus J, but Q min uh, infinity minus J is just infinity, and the same terms. So there is really no change whatsoever here. So this is the MA infinity process, and it's really that we replace the Q with infinity. And otherwise, there's nothing special about that. It, of course, gets messier if you derive the terms.